I want to continue to proclaim the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is recorded by the prophet Jeremiah in the 23rd chapter of his book, beginning with verse 5. Behold, the days are coming, declareth the Lord, when I shall raise up for David a righteous branch, and he will reign as king and act wisely, and do justice and righteousness in the land. In his days Judah will be saved, Israel shall dwell securely, and this is his name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness. In order that we might receive the glad tidings of the good news that the prophet has declared unto us, we must begin with the source of these glad tidings. So I want to talk about the one who will raise up the righteous branch, the one who has set his king upon his holy hill, the one who will execute judgment, the one who is saving his people and causing them to dwell securely. For here, in this text, Jeremiah will direct our consideration to God himself as the source, the Lord. See, he is the source. And in our receiving the truth of the divine nature and character of our God, the Lord, this text will bring much comfort and hope and joy into the people of God. For the one who is declared to be our righteousness holds no power in the granting of any of these things to his people if he himself is not righteous. Therefore, to the magnitude and the completeness of the righteousness of God, from the very beginning of the scriptures to the very end, this will be made perfectly clear, and it will be very emphatic. For the Lord is the righteous one. Righteous and justice are the foundations of his throne. He is gracious and compassionate and righteous. He is the Lord who speaks righteousness. All his things that he declares are right. All his commandments are righteousness, as are all his judgments, all his ordinances, and all his testimonies. His right hand is full of righteousness. He loveth righteousness, and he hateth iniquity. Or as the psalmist again would declare, there is no unrighteousness in him. The prophet Jeremiah would sum up this most glorious aspect of our God, of his divine nature and character, when he would announce, as the Lord liveth in truth, in justice, and in righteousness. The divine nature and character of God is righteousness itself. Righteousness itself is defined by the per very person of who God is. In the very person of who he is and what he does. And so as we consider what Jeremiah has said, this is the name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. There is good news to be received in this knowledge of our God for his people. A knowledge of our God that all, that all his people, from the least of them to the greatest of them, need to have. And we're not talking about a mere academic knowledge, but rather an intensely intimate knowledge of God. Specifically here, his righteousness. For the reception of his righteousness, as we will see later, is that which is very effective before him. The righteousness of God is not an abstract quality of God. It is not theoretical. It is intensely personal and marvelously effective. In other words, to the glory of God, it's very practical. For his righteousness cannot be thought of as existing in disassociation from that which he is doing in his creation. The scripture once again will affirm this of our God. He performs righteous deeds. He is righteous in all his ways, in all the work that he doeth. 
He is the one who rules over men righteously. His is a righteous reign, for he does not pervert justice or that which is right. He administers justice and righteousness for all his people. For all his judgments are true and righteous altogether. It is in this truth of God's divine nature that all his people hope in. Rather, they count on it. For he who shall judge the people, he will judge with a righteous judgment. And as to the practicality of God's righteousness to all his people, to us who believe, his righteousness will deliver his people and rescue them. He shall render unto man his righteousness. For only in the Lord is righteousness. And I want you to know that these samplings of the text of the scripture that I've just read we're not just put in here for fillers for my time, but rather that ye might know that what God does is right. Amen. The people of God need to know this about him, for what God has done will stand true, even under the most critical scrutiny, so that you might bring the experts of the law, be they in heaven or on earth, Bring in even the teams of experts of law, and they will not find a single flaw in what God has done. Amen. Men right now are allowed by God to be critical of him. They can call God unfair, and they can question his ways now. But rest assured, there is a coming a day when every mouth of the accuser will be stopped. But yet in that day, for the people of God, what a day of rejoicing it shall be. Amen. These are but a tastings of the righteousness of God in order that we might have hope in him. And it is incumbent upon his people to see him and to know him in the person of his high and complete righteousness. Amen. And so like the psalmist, let us declare... Thy righteousness, O God, is very high, who has done great things. Amen. O God, who is like unto thee? In our knowing God in this most glorious light of his righteousness, in all that he is, in all that he has done, and continues to do and will do, lies the power for us in what the prophet Jeremiah has declared. This is the name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Amen. For the prophet is declaring the one, the only one through whom the blessing of God can be attained. And that's the blessing of acceptance and access to the righteous one. Amen. You want access to the throne of grace? You must come the right way. You must come by the Lord our righteousness. You want to obtain mercy from God? You must come by the right way. Amen. You must come by the Lord our righteousness. You want to obtain mercy and find grace to help in your time of need? You must come by the right way. You must come by the Lord our righteousness, or these things will not be obtained and they will not be found. But for the saints of the Most High God, to those who are partaking of the goodness and the mercy of God now, those who are finding grace, they're finding it to be sufficient to fight the good fight of faith. And these are but a foretaste of the powers of God to come. For there is a soon coming day, that great and terrible day of the Lord, and on this day you had better know you had better know very intensely and very intimately the one whose name is the Lord our righteousness. On this day, you had better know Jesus as this one. For Jesus is the one the prophet Jeremiah is declaring, the only begotten Son of God. And Jesus is the one by whom God will render his righteousness unto us. 
In the fifth chapter of the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul would reveal, by one man, sin entered into the world. And death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, in that all have sinned. By this one act of disobedience in the garden, Adam could never have conceived the carnage he would wreck upon himself and to all who would bear his image. One man, one sin, and nothing would ever be the same again. The full and total nature of sin and its effect upon mankind were in that first transgression of Adam. And likewise, death entered in, in its totality, where it did not exist up until then. And the range of death that entered in was far more deadly than the perishing of the fleshly body. Amen. It was death to the totality of man, to his body, to his soul, and to his spirit. It was the most extreme death possible, an ultimate death, you might say. And it is most vividly displayed in the casting out of Adam and Eve from the garden, being cast from the very presence of God. Because of his one sin, man would henceforth be separated from God. And it is in that separation a devastating blow was delivered to Adam and his seed that would be incomprehensible in its magnitude. For the separation from God was total and complete. No access to God. One sin resulted in the total separation of God and man. A separation from God's fellowship. A separation from the glory of knowing him. We were blinded to his ways and his workings. We were deafened to the hearing of his voice. Separated from his benefits and his blessings. Dumb in tongues, unable to speak the things of God for we were out without the knowledge of God. To every extent possible, the sons of Adam were truly without God in the world. Even the righteousness that Adam had received from God in the creation, when the Lord God formed him from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of, breath of life, and he became a living soul, even that righteousness that came from God suffered a mortal wound. For through the fall, Adam and his race sustained an infinite and irretrievable loss in the matter of man's righteousness. Amen. Sin resulted in this complete loss of his righteousness in the nature of his creation. For by the one sin, man was no longer innocent of transgression. He did it. No matter what excuses were given, he did eat. But not only did Adam transgress by what he did do, he also transgressed by what he did not do. He did not keep the commandment of God. Of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat. So he was guilty in that which he did and that which he didn't do. Thusly, his original character and righteousness was completely wrecked. And if it were worse, if it was possible to make matters worse, and sin is able to do this, Men, all men, in their own strength, were not able to reverse or change this condition of being righteous before God. All men were without strength to do anything about it. And there were those of having no hope of reversing this condition. No strength and no hope in man of a remedy. With this, condemn with this condemnation to mankind, there is none righteous, no, not one, and in knowing the fullness of the glory of the righteousness of God, the one art of purer eyes than to even behold evil and cannot even look upon iniquity, we in our despair cry out, as Job did, how can a man be in the right before God? This is a question of eternal significance. And if any of you are interested, it must be answered in every one of us. For again, I will turn to this soon coming day, this day of the Lord, when we are going to have to come before the righteous judge. So we need to know now 
how are we going to stand before the righteous judge? You have to have that answer to that question Job posed. But to the glory of God, God himself has provided that answer and the remedy. And it comes from the very person and the very nature of God himself. Ephesians 2, 4 says, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, he has quickened us together with Christ, for it is by grace ye are saved. See, God himself would be the answer to Job's inquiry and to ours. And all of the sons of Adam's desperation, see, would be answered but God. Because it would be answered in the person of who God is. Because he is rich in mercy. Because of his great love. And it is by his grace that the remedy is provided. The remedy would be the Lord himself. His righteousness would deliver us. His righteousness would rescue us. The Lord himself would be our righteousness. This is the power of Jeremiah's announcement. And as we look back at this plan of God from the very beginning of his salvation, so wonderful was this aspect of his salvation that from the very beginning, God wanted to get the message out. And so he would raise up men, his holy prophets, to declare this good news. God will intervene. God himself will deliver his people by his mighty power and his outstretched arm. And the prophets would declare the coming of an enduring righteousness, one that wouldn't wear out. An everlasting remedy, because the righteous God who performs righteous deeds is the one who will do it. In so doing, God's prophets would begin to make known the one who would accomplish all of God's good pleasure. God's chosen one, God's apostle and high priest, God's Messiah, the one whose name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. The prophet Zechariah in the third chapter would affirm that we are clothed with filthy garments. He would, he would affirm that what God has said is true. Our righteousness is but filthy rags. But the identification of the situation would not be all he would declare. He would also be given to tell of what God would do. Remove the filthy garments from him would be the command from God. And note here in this command, it's not going to be a provision of a mere covering or a hiding of the filth, but a full removal. Remove the filthy garments, he would say. One might say, as far as the east is from the west. See, I have taken from you, the word of the Lord would continue. I have taken from you, and I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. Other virgins speak more, more clearly of this change. It talks about a change to rich garments, to festal ones. God would not only take away the sin, but he would clothe us in something which is even better than what we've ever had before. Moses also spoke of this good news to come as well. Remember the words of the Lord to the Pharisees in John 5, 46? If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. So what Moses wrote in, in Deuteronomy 21, 13, the Pharisees thought Moses was speaking of the manner that an Israelite might marry a captive woman. But they missed the main point. He was writing of the Messiah's work. In this text, Moses spoke of the one who would put off the raiment of captivity. Moses may not have known what the fullness of what he was saying, but to those who by the grace of God have put off the raiment of captivity, we know exactly what he was talking about. Amen. We know that the filthy raiment of our sin had to be put off because it had put us into a captivity to the prince of the power of this world. And Moses continued, And these who have put off the raiment of captivity 
they shall remain in thine house. Remaining in the house is a good thing, for it shouts of acceptance by God. For Jesus said, slaves or captives, they do not remain in the house. Only the sons abide forever in the house. David would be, would be another man God would raise up to prophesy of his Messiah. David was a given to announce the verdict from the throne of such of these who have put off the old. Psalm 32, 1 and 2 declares, Blessed, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. See, this is a blessed condition, and it is declared blessed by the righteous God. Amen. The psalmist would continue to announce that the putting away of sin would be a most favorable condition before God for men to be in by revealing the accomplishments of his Messiah. Psalm 85 declares, Thou hast been favorable unto thy land. Thou hast brought back the captivity of Jacob. And how has this most favorable thing been accomplished? Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people. Thou hast covered all their sin. Selah. For thou hast taken away all thy wrath. Thou hast turned thyself from the fierceness of thy anger. We have seen that this is glorious news. This is good news. And it's not solely in the taking off of the filthy garment, but the receiving and the putting on of the new, the rich garments, the festal robes, which are provided by the righteous God. The point I want to continue to hammer through here is that the righteous God is doing this all, and he is right in what he is doing. And he would continue in the bringing forth of this news of God's righteousness. Isaiah 46 would summon the people into hearkening unto me, ye stout-hearted, ye that are far from righteousness. He will give us a promise and a hope. There's hope to be taken care hold of here and to believe. He says, I'm going to bring forth my righteousness. I bring it near. It shall not be far off and my salvation shall not tarry, and I will place salvation in Zion. Amen. He would continue, my righteousness is near, my salvation has gone forth. My salvation is near to come, and my righteousness to be revealed. Blessed is the man that doeth this, and the son of man that layeth hold on it. And Hosea would declare, so break up the fallow ground, for it's time to seek the Lord, till he come and rain righteousness upon you. Amen. Well, this is all good news, brethren. Good news to a hopeless world and a helpless people. Those of an honest and good heart, they want to know more. How would God accomplish his promises? There were those, and they were not only on this earth, that desired to look into these things, into the workings of God. They desired to know who this one would be that would do all of God's good pleasure. And these are good askings of God. For you know that he who asks, it shall be given to him. Asking is not the same as questioning. Those who ask of God are delightful in his sight. And he answers these with ways that are more exceedingly abundantly more than we ask or think. Psalm 24, 3. Who may ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy presence? Here's that good asking again. To such as these, God reveals his salvation. It is he who has a clean hand and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood and has not sworn deceitfully. He shall receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the one I want to know. Amen. Zechariah would say, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you with righteousness and having salvation, 
gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And we want to have what this king is bringing. Amen. Daniel 9, 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness. See, at the time of the prophecy of Daniel, there was some, still some time they had to pass before this came to pass. But when the fullness of time had come, the Lord brought in everlasting righteousness. Amen. Malachi 3, beginning at the first verse, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide his coming? Who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and a fuller soap. And again, all very good askings of God. The answers to which we not only want to know, we need to know. But to the glory of God, he will not leave us on our own to discover the answers. God will reveal his Messiah. He shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He shall purify the sons of Levi. He shall purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering of righteousness. Amen. Through these prophecies of the coming of God's Messiah and so many more throughout the scriptures, they make known unto the weary world that help is coming. Deliverance is coming. Amen. Righteousness is coming. And the Lord himself will be the one, and he is not coming empty-handed. The gospel accounts will identify and prove to men that it is Jesus is the one that is written of, of Moses in the prophets and of the Psalms. And also that Jesus is the one who will, fill, will fulfill all that is written. And it will be the gospel of Jesus Christ that will make this known. That in Jesus and in him alone will the righteousness not only be revealed to us, it will be offered to us through him. Amen. The righteousness of God will be offered unto us as a gift from God through Jesus Christ, and we receive it by believing on him. The righteousness with all men need to stand before God, the only one that will be received of by the righteous God is God's righteousness itself. This is the only kind that can be accepted by the righteous God. And it comes from God through Jesus Christ, and we receive his righteousness by faith. This is the way of the righteous one. And the crux of what the Apostle Paul will tell us in the fourth and the fifth chapter of the book of Romans. In the words of the Apostle Paul, God's righteousness shall be reckoned or imputed unto us if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. That's Romans 4, 24. And the apostle will be very adamant in his declaration on this matter. The righteousness which is imputed unto us does not consist in our own obedience or our moral excellence. For the apostle tells us in Romans 4, 6, it is said to be without works. For no man can be righteous in the sight of God on the grounds of his own character or his own conduct. Amen. This has been proclaimed throughout Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. Neither does this righteousness spring forth from faith. Faith is not the source or the cause of this righteousness. For Paul makes it known that this is the righteousness of God. Romans 3, 21 and 22. The source is God. Our righteousness, called so by the richness of God's mercy, as seen by God, comes from God through Jesus Christ, is revealed unto us by Jesus Christ, is offered unto us by Jesus Christ, but we receive it from him as a gift by faith. Romans 5, 17. The apostle will pinpoint this even further, and in so doing, 
he answered Job's inquiry. How can a man be in the right before God? By one man, Jesus Christ. Jesus will be the emphasis and declared as the way, the only way of men receiving the righteousness of God. For it will be the righteousness of the one man, Christ Jesus, through his obedience, that the many will be made righteous. Romans 5, 19. For as through the one man's disobedience, Adam's, we heard about that a little while ago, as through his one man's obedience, disobedience, the many were made sinners, even so through the obedience of the one, Jesus Christ, the many will be made righteous. It will be the perfect obedience of the one man, Jesus Christ, his perfect obedience in his living and in his suffering and in his being obedient unto death, even to death on a cross, that is imputed to the believer. And this is the only ground by which the believer is pronounced righteous and freed from the curse and the wrath of God and entitled to eternal life. The apostle will make much of the obedience of the one man, Christ Jesus. The obedience of the one man, Jesus Christ, would be made manifest to men while he walked upon the earth in the days of his dwelling amongst us. It would be through Jesus Christ that the righteousness of God was revealed, for Jesus is the brightness of the glory of God's righteousness and his express image. Amen. Through the entirety of his life, Jesus would express the graciousness and the compassion and the righteousness of God. Jesus would speak righteously in all his judgments and in all his testimonies. Jesus loved righteousness and he hated iniquity. And in him was no unrighteousness. The entirety of the life of Jesus, taken as a whole, was righteousness itself. His life was the manifestation of the righteous law of the righteous God fulfilled. Jesus never offended against the commands of the righteous God. No, not even once. He always did that which was pleasing to God. Always. He always kept the ways of God, never departing from them. His eye never sparked with unholy anger, nor did his mouth utter an unjust word. His heart was never stirred by sin, and in his secret parts there was no fault that was hidden. In his understanding there was no defect, or in his judgment there was no error. Amen. In a foreshadowing of the Messiah's obedience to God, the obedience to the one man, Jesus Christ, the psalmist would make known this very aspect of his person, of his righteous person. Psalm 40, verse 7, in the words of our Lord, he would say, Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, I delight to do thy will, O God. Yea, thy law, law is written upon my heart. I have preached righteousness in the great congregation. Lo, I have not refrained my lips, O Lord, thou knowest. I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. I have declared the faithfulness in thy salvation. I have not concealed thy loving kindness in thy truth from the great congregation. You just think of this in contrast to Adam, who sinned by what he did and what he didn't do. Jesus is righteous in what he did and by what he didn't do. Amen. In Matthew, the 22nd chapter, Jesus was asked this question. He said, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said unto him, you shall love the Lord thy God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second is just like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. The whole law of what the, of what the prophets had declared about the righteousness of God. And so the righteous law consists of this, firstly, loving the, your Lord, the Lord your God with the entirety of your being. And Jesus did it, fully and completely. 
Jesus did not merely obey God by what he did. He was like God in his very thoughts and intents of his heart. Jesus' thoughts were God's thoughts, and Jesus' ways were God's ways. It was Jesus' meat and drink to do the will of him who sent him. And never had a man spent or was spent as Jesus was in his unwavering affection towards God. The afflictions of his flesh, be they hunger, thirst, shame, pain, would not distract him from what the Father had sent him to accomplish. Not even the prospect of death, even death on a cross, would deter Jesus from drinking the cup the Father had sent him to drink. For I always do those things that please him, would be the response of Jesus in every thought, in every intention, in every deed. In Jesus' perfect obedience to the Father, John 14, records that the world may know that I love the Father. And as the Father has given me commandment, even so I do. The second commandment is like unto the first. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Throughout the entirety of his life, Jesus would demonstrate and tax the very limits of divine resources in his devotion and his self-sacrificing and the loving of all men. He demonstrated this in his life, that he loved men more than his own life. And nowhere is that more clearly revealed when he hung dying on the cross, bearing the sin of the world in his sinless body. Greater love than no, hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. See, Jesus fulfilled the entirety of the law, of the righteous law of the righteous God. Every jot and tittle of it. Jesus magnified it, and he made it honorable before God. He loved the Lord his God with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his mind, with all his strength. And he loved his neighbor as himself. In so doing, he is pronounced righteous before God. His is a complete and unspotted righteousness, an unblameable righteousness, and an unblemished righteousness. Jesus is the righteousness of God revealed, and it is by the Father's doing you are in Christ Jesus, who has become wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Amen. And herein, to the people of God, lies the most precious part of this Lord's title that the prophet Jeremiah has revealed unto us, the Lord, our righteousness. The Lord himself is our righteousness. Not an inanimate or a merely external covering, Jesus himself is our righteousness. For in the words of the prophets, he is our rich garment. He is our festival robe. And there is great power in us being clothed in his righteousness, for his righteousness shouts of acceptance with the righteous God. All one has to do is look up and see the position of Jesus right now. He is seated at the right hand of God. See, He moves and he lives and he has his being in the very presence of the righteous God. That righteousness that comes from God through our Lord Jesus Christ holds even more for us. It holds the same for us. That in him, we are accepted. See, we too are accepted in him. In him, we have access to his mercy and to his grace. Since our righteousness has been accepted by God through Jesus Christ, we have peace with God and are being changed from glory to glory as we come into his presence. We are given the taste of the heavenly gift and the good word of God, and we partake of the Holy Spirit. Wonderful things for the righteous to partake in now. But this righteousness that comes from God through our Lord Jesus Christ holds even more for us. It holds power before the righteous judge, specifically in that soon coming day of the Lord. On that day, we have a scheduled appointment to, be, to appear before the righteous judge, to give an account of the things that have been done in this body. Of what account will you give? 
Have you thought about it? Have you prepared for it? At your appointment before the righteous judge, will you boast of your wisdom? Or the works that you have done by your own hand? Or the riches that you have accumulated? Well, I hope not, brethren. You do not want to come before the fully righteous God clothed in the works of your righteousness. Are you going to come before the fully righteous God whose every thought is righteousness, every utterance, every desire, every act, every deed is righteousness? Are you going to appear before this righteous one clothed in your own works of righteousness? Again, I hope not. For the scripture makes it clear that those who appear before him such are going to be commanded to depart from him forever. Or will you trust in what the righteous one has done through Jesus Christ in your behalf? Will you hang your eternity in your obedience or in the obedience of the one man, Jesus Christ? To those who have been washed by the blood of Christ, those who have believed the record of the Son of God, to those who know his name whereby he shall be called, the Lord our righteousness, when your appointment comes, and you come before the righteous God, and his call goes out for witnesses. The shout from the judgment seat, who shall bring a charge against mine elect? And as you stand there waiting for a response, and there is only silence in the heavens, praise God. It will not be because of your obedience, but because of the obedience of the one man, Jesus Christ, who obediently bore our griefs, who obediently carried our sorrows, who obediently was pierced through for our transgressions, who obediently took our chastising and our scourging, who obediently bore our stripes. It will be because of the obedience of God's righteous one. My righteous one will justify the many. As you stand there, isn't that good news? You're standing before the righteous God, and all there is is silence. When no one comes forth to condemn, the judge will say unto you, where are they? Does no one come forth to condemn you? And you can rejoice and say, no one, Lord. Then hear what the voice of the Lord will say, that what we've been waiting a lifetime to hear and neither do I condemn you. Enter into the joy of my rest. What a day of rejoicing that will be, brethren, for those who know the name of the one who is called the Lord our righteousness.